My name is Justin Rossum. Thank you for having me, Estripe, Onur and Onur and all the other people who made this possible. Um, I'm going to do a tiny introduction about myself. This image says a lot. Um, I have way too many slides, so I will, at some points I may hurry through. Uh, this is a Sinclair ZX81 computer. Um, the 81, yes, stands for the year in which it came out. I was 15 at the time, so you do the math. Uh, this was a very, very, very shitty computer. And, uh, but I, I had access to it, and the only thing you could do with that was to program it. So that kind of formed how I deal with computers, because uh, that, that was the first computer that I could play with on my own. And yeah, you had to program it, so I had to learn to program. So, and then I went to study graphic design a little later. That was a little odd, but somehow that came together soon enough. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about briefly, Frederick yesterday already uh, introduced Drawbot, the application. You can download it, load it from drawbot.com. It's a programming environment that works with the Python programming language. And um, this program called Drawbot, um, I originally wrote it, uh, I think, 2003 or something. And about 10 years later, 2013, Frederick looked at it and threw 90% away, rewrote it, and uh, made it way better. And uh, yeah, it started as an educational tool, and Frederick already showed this is kind of like how it looks. You have an area to write code, and you run it, and then if you didn't make a mistake, some image will appear. Um, so it was a little bit of background. Uh, uh, in the late 90s, as a type designer and font producer, we had been using more and more programming in our uh, daily practice as type designer to help producing uh, fonts to automate certain uh, uh, tasks. And uh, the Python programming language was kind of suited for that because it's relatively simple. It's uh, understandable for non-programmers, non-computer scientists, to, to some extent at least. It's relatively learnable. Um, but we found this whole methodology becoming more and more important uh, for our work and well the type media uh, department in The Hague started to be founded where we were uh, it's a one-year master course in type design um, and we wanted to teach our students who may not have any programming background at all some programming and to make it a little more fun uh, I created this this simple setup uh, mostly inspired by uh, well processing was around at the time and also the predecessor of that uh, designed by numbers by John Maeda a very influential uh, computational uh, arts uh, pioneer from MIT uh, uh, back then so anyway so this was used as a kind of a playground for students uh, to well to learn basic concepts and I'm showing now some pretty old uh, examples of, of things that students make, uh, uh, making some patterns um, in various ways, play with colors. Um, at some point, things started to look like shower curtains, and uh, we it became the shower curtain assignment. Um, you could play with some fake 3D. We'll see more of that. I think this was Nikolai Durak who made that. Um, then we had a little in, in the, the uh, Frederik Berlan studied at Type Media, and uh, in the same year, Andy Clymer also studied. We had a little competition. Is that even right, Frederick? No. no, it's not right. See, I'm so old, I get all these things wrong. It's comp okay, and in the year of Andy Clymer, that is true. Frederick has nothing to do with it so yet, yet. Uh, we had a little competition, like, hey, well, how, what should the, uh, uh, we need a new icon for Drawbot. Um, what should it look like? It should be programmed in Drawbot itself. So we had a little competition. Andy Clymer won, he made this and then it got stuck into a drawer, as things do. And then only much later, when Frederick discovered that, he, uh, he uncovered it, and it actually became the icon. It's now already evolved several times in co collaboration with Andy. Anyway, more examples. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a fractal tree. Um, you can experiment in all kinds of ways, either with graphics uh, or with algorithms. Um, with colors, the, the nice thing is, so what we do these days, usually I, I try to make the students uh, program letter forms in, 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 a, in, in a very broad sense. So it can be very simple, can be very complex. But the nice thing if, of having this environment is that we can immediately play with color and non, uh, uh, traditional fonts, if we're, color fonts are still kind of up and coming, but it's not all that widely supported. So fonts, 
for the most part, are very black and white entities. So to have a little bit more freedom and to, to build this little typographic environment with code, sometimes it gets back, back to black and white. This is uh, Philip Neumeier experimenting with all kinds of serifs. He hated coding, but he made this really nice thing. So I don't know, uh, I probably traumatized him for life. Um, this is, uh, was an experiment in, uh, by Tillman, who is sitting somewhere in the back, who was experimenting like how, how if, if I want an algorithm that calculates a, a drop shadow, how does that work? How do I, where do I need to cut my curves? And at that moment, this was like in between he was here, uh, which already shows a lot of the complicated math that goes into su uh, such a thing. So people take that in very, very different directions. This was uh, Tetsuo Suzuki who made kind of a puzzle of pieces and uh, um, made a, a two by three a grid of puzzle pieces to make letters with. So it's hopefully in a playful way we get people to, uh, to code. And then there's this aspect, uh, uh, of course this little joke I stole from the internet, because um, after this I'm gonna show some of the things that I've been working on as side project also uh, to educate myself to experiment a little bit and it may feel a little bit like this i mean you saw the the simple code the four lines that draws a rectangle on an oval and then boom so anyway um i started doing these exercises for my own fun mostly and started posting them online and people started saying hmm, you should collect them somewhere well at that moment the tumblr was still a thing that people used so i started the tumblr that uh, it's still around, but I don't update. For, for like a couple months, it was in fact a daily thing where I almost daily uploaded a little animation. This was the very first one that started it off. Um, I should probably go a little faster um, because I have a lot of slides to show. Anyway, the, th this was a very simple thing. It's, it's uh, a square drawn many times, uh, uh, moving to the right and then somehow changing the rotation, figuring out the math, and building the, uh, uh, exporting that as an animation. What surprised me at the time is it's really only a, a, a white rectangle or square with a black stroke around it, but the kind of shades, the, 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 the gradients that appear were, um, I didn't really think about what would happen, and they give it uh, some sort of dimensionality that I didn't put in there. It was kind of a happy accident. So uh, in case, I mean, if, uh, uh, there's a lot of Drawbot documentation on the Drawbot site. Uh, as Frederick mentioned, there's also a forum. Uh, it's maybe a little hard to get into from nothing. But uh, for instance, I have, I have a vid Vimeo channel too, just like Gore. Uh, it has one video. Uh, and it contains a tutorial uh, of how to make this thing. So if you're a little further and you want to cre create an animation, that's, you can look it up, how some of these techniques work. Anyway, I continued experimenting for myself, sometimes publishing the source code, sometimes just looking at these jellyfish or whatever, um, trying to make groups of groups of groups. This started as a, um, I, I usually, when I work with students, I make a little demo how to program some form of a spiral. And I also usually have a demo how to draw a grid. And this is like, okay, now let's draw a grid of spirals so these things can come together. Um, and, uh, Sometimes it becomes a letter. Um, so th there was a period, this is already, this is late 2015. This is, this work is getting really old. I saw this image uh, and I was fascinated by it. I, at the time, I didn't know who did it. Uh, it turns out it was a very analog kind of image done with this lenticular uh, piece of glass or plastic even. Uh, the person who made it was studying at, at, at RISD and it turned out I knew her because she was a former student of mine in, uh, from Cooper in New York where I sometimes teach. Uh, that was a total coincidence. But I saw this and I realized, ah, maybe it's done like that and this is a nice programming exercise. Let's recreate this, not maybe exactly the same. But if you look closely, for instance, that middle letter, that A, the slices actually contain bits of A that are upside down. So there's this lens effect happening um, the only thing that I was a little disappointed about of, of this work is w that it didn't move. So that was like the, the step that I added to it. So this is my interpretation of that work. Um, now you think uh, this is an endless loop that became my uh, uh, other hobby, like let's program loops that are seamless. Um, and this, yeah, it, it goes on and on. You don't really see where it starts, where it ends. And in fact, this is a very short loop. Uh, it's only as long uh, uh, as the t time it takes for one slice to move up one unit. I will quickly show the 
the timer here. So that's all there is to it. The rest is kind of an illusion. So more uh, uh, examples from graphic design. This was posted by, I think, the Lou Balance Center uh, on Instagram. This is a, design, a, a Dutch design from late 60s uh, done with by uh, uh, Wim Krauer and collaborators. And again, I saw here something. I, 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 I saw the, the, the rhythm in this. This is a very algorithmic ca kind of design. And again, I was disappointed that it didn't move. So. Uh, my interpretation. And it turned out the, syst the, the original was already so logical that to make it move in a smooth way was no additional effort at all, really, because it, it was already very complete in its idea and its, uh, uh, how logically it was uh, uh, executed to begin with. Anyway, sometimes I play with 3D things, work with teaching myself how 3D vector math works. Um, I was playing with uh, effects that look 3D, but you know, th this is done with Drawbot, but Drawbot is a very primitive application. It's not uh, Blender, it's not Rhino, it is, a, it is something that creates PDF data. It draws, it's very much 2D. Um, so how is this done? Um, it's, this is drawing a whole lot of circles that are, uh, have, a, have a diameter uh, of the thickness of this apparent uh, wire that are drawn from back to front in the right color. Uh, it's calculated with a lot of 3D math and then sorted accordingly. It was, for me, a way to, to, to learn uh, about 3D graphics. Uh, and uh, in the next disk variation, you kind of see how it's built. This is the same, the exact same code with one number different, like just a lot fewer uh, uh, circles being drawn. But this kind of illustrates how it's done. It's a little less slick, and some people like, e this, like this one even better. Anyway, so I should continue some experiments with uh, noise algorithms that I found. I usually try to you know, learn about concepts that exist and like, try to translate it into code or find existing code. This is also me trying to figure out some 3D math, like how to, s to slice some boxy object. And uh, well, in this case, it had to be a letter. And I took that a little further. And again, this looks very 3D, but those shadows are pretty much in PDF. You can make give objects a, a drop shadow, as if you're like you're having a rectangle, and then there's a little drop shadow behind it. You can control like what color does the drop shadow have and how much is it offset. Well, you can abuse that to kind of make this dimensionally looking thing. Anyway, it still takes a long time to render. It's very much not real time. So to, I would love to add a MIDI controller to this. Not going to work. Because the, the kind of the, the, uh, the, the technology that's, or the, 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 the way this is built, it's really not very efficient. Drawbot is very nice and educational. It's not all that real time. It's not all that fast. So uh, yay for web development and web MIDI, because those things belong there. Anyway, um, this is a little too. Um, I'm going to show a collaboration with uh, Luna Maurer, a German graphic designer from Amsterdam, and Eric from Blockland. She was uh, asked to design a new corporate identity for this institution called STEM. Uh, it's a very interesting small uh, uh, institute in Amsterdam um, that uh, encourages research after uh, human computer interfaces to control music. So. Uh, it's th th they are about music and uh, experimental electronic music and especially about different ways to control. Well, maybe algorithms, maybe other kind of electronics. Anyway, that's the, the backstory of this, but I need to. So uh, Luna Maurer um, made this idea. Let's, le let's make letters out of uh, tape. And uh, she soon found out that um, that it, uh, um, to, to, it, it was supposed to be very, uh, a relatively low budget as uh, a job. Uh, let me fix my typos here. That's terrible. Uh, and this is, uh, is it okay now? Okay. Now I lost my train of thought. That's also great. Anyway, so she uh, uh, realized that okay to make like. Uh, text for a poster uh, or for signage in the building. Uh, to do that with tape every time, that's going to be take a lot of work and also will be inconsistent. But hey, how about putting an algorithm behind that? She approached me and Eric to like, hey, can you guys maybe um, 
build such a thing, a program? And uh, we said, yes, of course. And Eric went on and drew this geometric stroke-based uh, straight, straight lines uh, uh, font. Uh, and I wrote some code around it that draws strokes. And it's, it became a little toy. It's an application that uh, we have a stroke with. There's, they're kind of separate pieces of tape. And uh, um, the main idea actually was that there would be parallel pieces of, of tape that would interact somehow. So uh, there's a lot of stuff to play with here. It was the idea that, that the people at STEIM themselves, they're smart people, they're very fluent with, uh, with computers and technology in general. Um, they don't have a lot of ongoing budget for graphic design, but they can make their own posters and maybe using this tool to create some lettering on the spot and that uh, will be different every time. So this ended up with an algorithm that kind of, it's, well, it's not really lettering because it's, uh, well, computerized, uh, but it's also not really typography because the parts kind of respond to each other. It depends on what wor word you type, how the things will interact. Well, there's a bunch more uh, parameters, we can start over if we want, uh, so we can make a couple of, there's some, uh, some randomness in there that we can do, but there's, sometimes it's nicer to uh, add some rotation, you get these uh, squirrely lines. Um, anyway, so the user can play with this, there's also some color options that I won't show now, and you can save that recipe and later replay it on a different text as well, so. But anyway, this is to show what kind of, uh, um, uh, things we do with this, this technology, programming in Python, uh, with this STEIN project, Drawbot was not directly involved. The, most of the things I will show, Drawbot played some role or other. Um, here, this is a more, re the, 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 the STEIN thing was already from 2010, so it's uh, ancient by modern standards. This is, a, uh, the next project I'm gonna show is a little more recent, V2, a similar kind of institute, now not in Amsterdam, but in Rotterdam. It's not about music, but about uh, well, the unstable media. They are kind of this nice, uh, they, they've been around for a long time and uh, they stimulate very experimental art um, with lots of computers and whatever and video. Uh, and uh, well, um, I proposed to, to them to make a parametric logo. Uh, this will kind of look like a variable font, but it's a parametric it's a parametric system. Uh, well, it contains exa exactly three letters. Well, an, uh, that's a V, a two, and an underscore. So, but it, it's code, it's not in a font. And uh, I, I made a little user interface for them so they could play with it themselves, but there's a whole bunch of parameters they can play with, depending on the purpose. Is, is it for, uh, for a, a, a Twitter icon? Is it for a poster? Is it, uh, anyway, I will, so, um, offer some animation possibilities. Um, it has some slant thing that actually takes optical corrections. It's, it's not a mechanical slant of the outline. It's, it's kind of a, a center line, which is dressed with some sort of pen, pen system. Um, okay, yeah, the usual contrast, wide, narrow, but some contrast. And here, the, the, in the next step of the animation, the, there's kind of some, some broad knit pen simulation possible. Uh, but look, that pen angle can change. And the way this moves, you cannot even do directly in a variable font unless you add a lot of intermediate steps. But this, as, as it's an algorithm and not a pure interpolation of the outline, you have some different possibilities here. Maybe it's the same thing, moving a little faster. Anyway, to layer things, this is the same principle, but with some, some more complex layers, uh, offered some opportunities for animations um, or some other. Um, proposed some typography for them, so made some coded uh, moving uh, typography which they use on their website. Anyway, um, next project. It's more or less a portfolio kind of uh, talk, um, but it's, also, it's a lot about collaboration. The next, uh, um, next project is a collaboration with Hansje van Halem, the, the uh, a graphic designer from Amsterdam that Peter Bilak already mentioned. He, the, the wind typeface that he showed was designed by her. Um, she is a very prolific graphic designer, um, mostly known for, for posters, book jackets. She designed the latest book by Gerard Unger. She's also a book designer. Um, but um, she, well, sometimes she works with an assistant, but she ha runs a pretty much a one person studio. At some point, she was approached by Lowlands Festival, which is a large music festival 
the one of the largest in, in our country, uh, a three days uh, festival in August, um, whether she would be willing to make a new identity, a new style for them. Um, this is, this is a, a snapshot of the, the, the website of Hansje showing some of her work. Let's, let's scroll through that briefly. You already see some Lowlands examples. Which kind of, she works a lot with treated type and a lot with patterns and a lot with, with color. She has a very distinctive style. Uh, she works very digitally. She is like a, a genius. Uh, uh, she's a genius with, with Illustrator and f knows all the tricks. She works with cu custom plugins. Um, the cool thing about her work, I find, is that you usually don't immediately see how it's done. You know it's digital, you suspect Illustrator, but really how it's done, I don't know. So that's intriguing. And, uh, you know, at some point I, I had met her through my teaching work at KBK in The Hague, where she guest teached at some point, or at some point we bumped into each other, and I asked her, hey, your work, uh, all those, those very rhythmical, patterny kind of things, is there any coding involved uh, in that? And she, uh, no. So she has her ways of doing that, which is, okay, cool. Uh, but that my question got stuck in her head. So when a couple years later she got the question from Lowlands Festival to, um, to make an, a new style, she was thinking, hmm, this is going to be a huge thing. Uh, we need some automation here. So I can maybe design a nice word, but now what if we need 100 words? That's going to be a lot of work. Uh, so the style, based on some of her earlier work that was chosen, was kind of based on this, this little sketch um, that was developed a little further. Well, she experimented a little bit with this. This is uh, a, a small clip of her presenting the already made the, the, the style as it was in 2017. It's been evolving ever since. Uh, uh, we're having the third edition with this style now, but it's, it's been pretty radically different every year. Um, but how it started, I mean, she, um, I sat down with her. She, I, I had seen what it looked like. If we go quickly go back here, uh, this is already done with the software that I wrote, but that's kind of the principle uh, behind it. But uh, she showed me how she did it because I didn't, like earlier, that space example that I showed, it was like I saw that, ah, ah, that's how it's done, let's do it like this. And this is one of those examples like, hmm, I have some ideas, but how it's really done, I just, I don't know. So she explained me, and then, okay, in Illustrator, I start with this. Then I, she ha has this big recipe, she documents that because she is uh, afraid herself that she cannot repeat a certain process. Uh, so it starts with horizontal vertical lines, how they intersect, there's plus minus counter shapes, um, uh, grid size, well, you know, uh, there, um, it went on and on. This, I think these examples are already made with the, the algorithm later, but um, yeah, so she came with this question like, hey, this particular style, can we make that uh, easier to use? Can we, make, can we automate that somehow? Um, well, so I, I, I built that for her, and at the same time, there were a bunch of parameters that she already thought of, like the grid size or how, how things were, but uh, in the process, uh, while making custom software for this project, we added a bunch of more parameters that turned out to be useful. Um, so like the th stroke thicknesses, vertical, uh, horizontal, roundness of shapes. Um, there's a whole lot of simple things that can be changed, like also how the text is placed on the grid can be uh, automated. Uh, then at some point she also realized, okay, we ne actually also need a font as a fallback. We cannot algorithmically generate everything. That was kind of the cool thing of the, the project so far that it, it's the main style is not something you can put in a font. It, it's just just not how fonts work because there's interaction between the letters. But, you know, fonts are kind of practical. There had to be some uses of fonts anyway. So there was a sp particular setting that she uh, thought, well, that would be nice to have a font for. And that's um, what we then made. And uh, like a little, because the whole algorithm, this is me emailing to her, like uh, uh, saying, hey, it's working, which means we can now also make fonts out of it. So that was one particular step. Um, so here you see some examples of those fonts there, uh, obviously not made for very small sizes. Um, so here the top row is like a word, how it's generated as a whole, and the, the bottom two ones are from the fonts. So there's a lot of vari more variety possible in the, in the, in the really uh, algorithmic version. Some icons have to be designed. This is, uh, again, th th this is a big collaboration. Um, I provided the code, um, I wrote the code pretty much on her specifications and we collaborated on that. 
um, and made a workflow that she could work with. Uh, we discussed like uh, how should that work for her. Um, should we make, li like within this time project, should we make a user interface with sliders and buttons so she can do something? In the end, we've decided for something different. Th I'm getting a little distracted here at some point, that festival is so large that at some point you see the results of your algorithm on huge screens behind whatever. That was kind of exciting. This is actually the font, so this should be a little less exciting. Uh, a tiny live demo, demo I will do. I'm not keeping... So this is Drawbot, this is actual Drawbot. Uh, this is not a video. Live coding, so there's a, there's a special library, Python library, that I wrote for this project. It's the project started in 2017. We're still using that code. It has been evolving more or less. But if I run this code, then this comes out. So we can zoom in here. This is a drawbot preview area. This is uh, a vector data, so it's scalable. It's exportable as PDF. We're actually looking at a PDF previewer. But it's all parametric. So here's the text. We can also do is type run. And, okay, that's only the text, so that's so that we can play with uh, the, the, the point size, maybe. Uh, there are some basic parameters, uh, 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 typographic parameters we can play with. But what is more interesting are, like, the graphic details, like uh, how, how rounded are those corners. Uh, can they be too rounded? Yes, they can be too rounded. There's all kinds of settings where it's going beyond the, the reasonable, but that's then... Uh, so, uh, uh, Hansje is not a coder. But this is what I showed her here. I mean, it's pretty much a list of, of names and some values, uh, and she can work with that. So she, uh, we documented all the parameters she plays with that. Um, uh, let's see, okay, that round corner radius is now really too wide. This should get some ugly overlaps. Pen rotation, we can, it's kind of, these lines are sort of made with some sort of pen-ish idea, so we can kind of rotate, which has then an effect on the, uh, Thicknesses of the strokes. Uh, there are some on-off parameters, like okay, this is going in the direction of those fonts. Let's see. Um, is we can flip the grid around. There's uh, well, the, uh, obviously the grid size. So it's all it's kind of numeric stuff, um, but it's easy. It's just a little script that you can save, and uh, she and her assistant uh, work with that. Uh, so that's that's pretty much how some of this works in a in a, in a uh, real setting. There's also some animation possibilities. So this was uh, a bit of live demo. A lot of print material was made with this. This is from the, the second generation, 2018, where we added support for, for color layers and overlaps. So uh, the final graphic design, I have very little to do with, but without my code, they, couldn't have been, uh, they wouldn't have been able to do it. So it's a really nice kind of uh, collaboration. There's, there's uh, more, and people, more and more people got involved. Like in 2018, also an animator got involved. Uh, making really nice animations. You can see like a, a, a festival of this scale, there's just so much print stuff and huge scale banners that are being produced and, and merchandising. Uh, it goes on and on. Um, anyway, but then the animator, this is, uh, so Hansen had an assistant, Marjolein Rinkes, who would do some of the production work, some of the design work. Uh, and then a fourth per person, Jurian Yur Hoss, got involved, uh, um, an excellent animator who started with, uh, in, in, uh, he, he made a whole bunch of fairly graphic uh, um, patterns of animation that we could then feed into the code, into the, the software that I wrote. So this is treated with my algorithm, but the underlying animations were done by a real animator. I can make things move, but I'm not a motion designer. Um, so uh, that was kind of an interesting new input. And then, uh, yeah, that combined with typography, this was one of the, my favorite uh, page not found pages at the time, maybe still is. Uh, the website of 2018, uh, some better. One of the cool aspects of this, that some of this was actually working on the web server itself. So we had these banners in this particular style. I have two examples here. Uh, the background graphics were uh, preset animations made by Yuri Jan Hoss, but these animations were made on the web server uh, because the editorial team that runs the, webs the website would add a new artist and they would enter the name of the artist and then a process would start and it would generate a bit of video of these odd proportions which could then be used um, on the website itself. So um, a, a lot of this, uh, I mean, that's not real time or super fast, but it's, uh, uh, they were able to make, to, to produce these animations without my help or Hans's help, because all that code was nicely running on the server. 
Anyway, more physical stuff behind this, these big patterns. Um, somehow missed the photo. Ah, this is the big, yeah, th um, this particular tent, this festival is organized over a group of tents. Uh, um, the design of this particular one was done by uh, Marjolein Rinkes, uh, Hans's uh, main assistant. And, you know, I have nothing to do with the design of this huge scale thing, except I know that all those curves there come from the code that I wrote, the way those curves go around, those Bezier curves that we've talked about in other... Uh, th th yeah, so there is something that I touched that is still in there that you cannot really see. So I feel really connected to that piece of work, even though... Uh, I, the first time I saw it was when I was standing in front of it. Um, so, uh, video stuff. So, for 2019, I only have one little image. They took it a, a, a step further. Uh, my role in the, in the last generation has been very small. I made some tiny adjustments to the software. Uh, the role of Jurian Hoss, the animator, became a lot larger. He took some raw input material and creates, uh, created more or less this particular style of very fluid... Uh, stuff. It's really exciting, exciting for me to see what then comes out. I still see the results of my software, but the style keeps changing every year. Anyway, so that was the Lorentz uh, uh, project. I am already at the final chapter of my talk. Um, we haven't talked really about, well, axes, we haven't word, used the words yet, but we saw, like, oh, I, I showed the parameters in the Lorentz code. Um, Parameters, axes, this is concepts that's, uh, that, that uh, are important in, in our work um, a lot, especially if you're coding. Now, Gerrit Noordzij. Gerrit Noordzij. <laughs> Thomas, are you there? <laughs> Gerrit Noordzij. <laughs> let's, let's get together later. We'll get it. Well, you, 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 you <laughs> it's, it's one of those Dutch, it's a Dutch name that contains all those difficult Dutch sounds. It's the G and the A and no, anyway. Uh, Gerrit Noordzij is, is a very influential figure. Uh, he was my teacher at KBK in The Hague, um, as well as many others, Peter from Blokland, Eric from Blokland, well, this whole, the, most of our uh, uh, type media uh, staff team had some influence from him. Um, what I'd like to show, so he was uh, a thinker, a designer, type designer, calligrapher, um, writer. Um, he was writing already, uh, uh, he thought a lot about uh, theory of writing, how that relates to type design. Um, he has been writing like articles already in the 70s. Eric from Blockland has, uh, has a very nice lecture about that, which he will, I think, deliver on Monday in New York. And he, I think he d also did it in, in, in Porto at the uh, font stands, right? Yeah. So um, anyway, what, uh, uh, in 1982, there was a small book published called The Stroke of the Pen in English, um, which was kind of the first uh, version of his uh, theory about writing in book form. There has been some predecessors in, in article form. And um, one of the pages, uh, this is a very poor photo, but I will here I have a slightly better scan of the, uh, from the book. Um, I have to say a little bit more. We've been talking about uh, variable fonts, uh, multiple master fonts is n not new technology. It goes back, uh, uh, Peter Bilok mentioned Metafont from Donald Knut. That's either late 70s or early 80s. It's very important and influential technology. Um, however, there's, there was one company in Hamburg called URW, still around, and they uh, are, became the makers of Icarus uh, font design software. They, I just checked with my colleague Frank Blockland, who collaborates with them really closely. Probably back in around 1973, they were already uh, having the technology to interpolate letter forms. So you draw a, a light letter and a black letter uh, and make the computer calculate something in between. 1973, can you imagine? So anyway, um, uh, Gerrit Noortij was thinking of his theories about contrast, contrast kind, uh, the amount of contrast. And uh, he went to ATAPI conferences, uh, uh, um, met Peter Caro, the founder of URW. Peter Caro is, is really a pioneer in digital font uh, uh, technology, uh, the, 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 the brain behind this Icarus software. Um, and uh, URW, together with URW, and I think Peter from Blockland may have also played a role in that, uh, Gerrit Noortzai drew um, eight E's, I mean the corners of each square, four of each, 
and um, gave the drawings to URW and they digitized that in their uh, Icarus way and somehow were able to produce these interpolations. Uh, so this book is from 1982. So the interpolation stuff at URW had been going on for a while already. Um, then late, much later, um, Eric and Peter van Blokland, uh, the, the, the brothers, had access to the, uh, uh, well, being also friends with Gerrit Noordzij, uh, got the drawings of these things, or maybe a later generation that, well, similar drawings, and uh, uh, redigitized them. Um, and then they shared that digitization data with me, and I'm going again to a demo. This is an application that looks very primitive, because it is, it's from 2003. I updated it a couple times, so it still works, but it's, it was kind of, a, so here is the letter E from Gerrit Noordzij in this particular digital form with some sliders where we can play with that contrast. I kind of made that, it should have been a web app uh, already like two years after I made this, but I never got around to it, so there's still no web app. Well, there's been variable fonts made of this single E. Um, anyway, so lowering the contrast from the, base position, uh, increasing the contrast, but also the contrast kind. And that is not so, we can also interpolate between these two, if we go back to that slide, um, that was pretty much the live demo part of this, it's not super much, uh, just wanted to show that we had something interactive quite a while ago. Um, Gerrit Noortza soon after this realized himself uh, that, hey, uh, these two distinct, well, okay, I, sh I should briefly explain the left side, the left square is what he calls translation contrast based on the Brodney pen, more or less. The right side you see expansion contrast based on a flexible pen where the contrast is done by uh, applying pressure to the pen. But he realized also that there maybe there are things between these two squares. And uh, that's uh, when he came up with the, um, the, 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 the Gerrit Noortza cube that became such an icon, at least for us, uh, it became a, a very dear image. So this, uh, on the left you see uh, the streek, Theorie van het Schrift. This was a reworking of the stroke of the pen. I, uh, sorry, I don't have the publication date uh, um, ready. Uh, a, a Dutch version, completely rewrite, it's a little thicker. And Gerrit made this new uh, illustration for the, the front cover. And he did that, it's interesting to know, uh, I think he did it based on interpolations. There's some story how it technically got done, but in the end he had a physical model that he f took a picture of. And then somehow, this is in more or less analog times. Um, so this was half, half analog, half digital. Um, then at some point there was uh, um, uh, an English rewrite, The Stroke, Theory of Writing, which is a little more than a translation of the Dutch version. Uh, published by Hyphen Press, uh, relatively soon uh, 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 selling out. Uh, but Gerrit made, uh, made another version of the cube, uh, which you see in the middle, middle picture there. Um, the differences are very subtle. He made that himself with interpolation blending in Illustrator, we suspect. And, um, well, Hyphen Press, uh, the, the, the publishing house from uh, Robin Kinross, stopped publishing things and you know this book had been out of print uh, for a while and there was some demand it's a uh, uh, but um, there was not going to be a reprint from hyphen press um, I think the prices on on eBay went up I mean it's really a small book and it's uh, but it's it became a collectible so Eric from Blockman got together with a bunch of people uh, and it got republished quite recently uh, so it's available again, pretty much uh, the same book. Um, so it's a much be better version of the book in terms of content. It's, uh, well, it was uh, edited by, uh, by a very good editor. It reads really well. The original English uh, book was mostly written by Gerrit himself, even though he's a genius with language, it was not edited by a native speaker. So anyway, in terms of language, this is just a much better book. Um, <laughs> However, so Eric was like, okay, we need to, let's update the cover of this book a little bit. So it was published by Uitgeverij de Buitenkant. How much time? Almost done. Very well. Uh, this is almost my last slide, I promise. Um, so, but, yeah, I'm going way too much into the detail of this, <laughs> this cube anyway. Um, 
we looked at like the, the various versions and we kind of went back to that analog. We, we kind of liked it a little better. And then I had that code that uh, calculated that and I had already done some experiments based on the letters that Gerrit drew and that the von Blockmans digitized. I made a uh, little robot uh, playful thing with that. I played a bit with 3D here. Uh, but we wanted to reproduce, use this data for the new cover of the book. And then uh, Eric wanted to match the original quite well. It turned out because it's a photograph, there was a tiny bit of perspective in there that, you know, that was kind of neat. I mean, it was made it a little less uh, straight. So uh, I rewrote the code a bit and played with the amount of perspective needed. This is now an animation, and if I quickly stop it. Okay, no, it's, uh, I somehow can't make it stop. Uh, I can't make it go. Anyway, so we fiddled a bit with the parameters to find the right amount of perspective to more or less match that thing. So. Yeah, here we have the, the three axes of ease uh, according to Norte, and uh, this is how it looks in the current current reprint. So it's uh, not moving, but uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cube of ease that Gerard drew, and uh, now it's printed. And that was my talk. Thank you very much.